What's up, everybody? Welcome. Welcome to the Artist of Data Science. Happy hour. It is Friday, August 27th. This is happy hour number 47. Just a few more weeks until we get that one year mark. Man, I can't believe it. How awesome the community has grown in just under a year. Hopefully, you guys got a chance to check me out on the great and powerful Ken G, his podcast, Ken's Nearest Neighbor. I uh, was on that, had a great conversation with Ken. Um, please do tune in and let me know what you think. Hopefully you got a chance to tune into the episode I did uh, with Jeffrey Lee, released that earlier today. Uh, if you have not yet listened to it, um, I think you'll enjoy the opening sizzler. Jeff uh, drops a freestyle rap for us at the with a pretty sick beat in the background. So hopefully you guys get a chance to tune into that. Um, yeah, man, I'm excited to have all you guys here. So I was... Uh, Got a, I got a question here that I want to open up with. Um, so this is kind of inspired by uh, one of my friend Shantana's post. She made a post earlier today, friend of the show, friend of the happy hours. And Shantana was talking about how she had uh, made a blunder with respect to interpreting a histogram uh, during a meeting and during a presentation. And it was funny because just a few minutes prior to that, I had made a Flub as well. Uh, I was doing a bit of prospecting, as it were, trying to get you know some people on podcasts for paid sponsorships. And I have a, I've got a template that I work with, and this template uh, where I want to put the person's name will have bracket name. And there was more than one email that I sent out where I forgot to change the bracket name to the actual person's uh, name. So I'm wondering, what's something that's just super derpy? that you've done this week and what's your reaction to that been what's your reaction to your derpiness been like uh let's uh let's go to eric for this one thank you for making me first derp here well i guess second derp uh so I actually just just earlier today, I was working on a dashboard to deliver and I met with the stakeholder. I was like, yes, I was super stoked, ready to go. And he looks, he's like, on the third row, it says zero minus 50 is 31. I was like, well, crap. <clears throat> so like, clearly, like there was like, there's a glaring error of basic arithmetic where I had just forgotten to change one field in Tableau with another uh, when I had recalculated it. And uh Fortunately, you know, I, my, my reaction has just been like, oh crap. All right. Well, we're going to dig into it, you know, and I just kind of just own that I feel kind of stupid and then just move along with it. And then, you know, people are, I think when you, when I own feeling like a goofball, I think people are less like, I mean, they just like kind of roll with it, you know? Yeah. I like that. that I like that kind of uh, reaction to just like, yeah, shit happens. Um, so hopefully, you know, if some of those people that I was prospecting, uh, hopefully you'll still consider uh, my proposals. Antonio, what about you? What's something derpy that you've done uh, this week? Um, I, I, I get familiar. I'm very familiar with the situation that you're in where I tried this like automation. I'm like, you know, I, I was like going down a list of people I wanted to connect with. And I'm like, like, I'm going through this and it's going to take me like, you know, like 30 minutes to just go through this list. I'm like, why not just automate it? This site says we can do it. And the same thing with me. It says, hey, like first name. And I put instead of the brackets, I put the parentheses. So now people are accepting my LinkedIn requests. And it feels so stupid because it says, hey, first name in parentheses. I mean, people are being nice enough that they're not saying anything about it but i feel so bad so i've sometimes i've just been like just laughing just continuing the conversation like i it, this never happens like hey you know because i do genuinely want to like meet these people but it was just very time consuming so i, I start i just start continue the conversation yeah like you want to tell me about like what got you into data science and things like that but i'm definitely definitely can relate to, to you um the other one I think that I have, and it wasn't this week, it was more of um, happened when I, when I started, I was working in fraud analytics. I think this is, it always makes me laugh because, and I think it's a, it's a good lesson is I was 
doing some kind of fraud stuff and stopping some kind of like fraudulent emails. And I did analytics on it and I stopped. I forget what the number was now, but based on my calculations, I went up to the senior manager, like all cocky and stuff, you know, just fresh out of college. I was like, just saved you $400,000. And I've been here like, you know, like a month. I've been working on this for like, you know, you know, compared to how much you're paying me, I'm, make, I'm, I'm doing this company a huge, like, you know, gains. And he's like, impressive. Let me, let me look. And he takes a look at the numbers. And I thought that for every like email I was saving, I was saving him like 0.04 cents, like 0.04 cents. Well, it turned out for every email that I was saving, it was costly. I was saving like 0.00000004. So when we ended up calculating it correctly, the project I worked on for one month and I got so cocky about, I ended up saving the company about four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he's like, "Yeah, thank you, Antonio. I, I'm gonna go buy myself a Starbucks coffee now with all this this money you saved us." So since then, I I just keep quiet. I don't take credit. I don't take blame. <laughs> that's, that's a good one, man. Young, young cocky guys just like yeah look at all this money i'm saving you yeah especially when i was coming out of college i thought like oh my god i i, I know two months of data like i'm killing it <laughs> russell what about you and uh, for everybody joining in on the live stream thank you so much for joining in everybody just coming into the uh zoom room here thanks for coming into the zoom room question we're opening up with is what's something that you've done that's been super derpy this week and um what was your reaction to that? Uh, so happy to uh, to have all you guys share. So if you'd like to share, go ahead and let me know uh, right there in the uh, in the chat. And um, also, if you have questions, let me know wherever it is that you're watching, whether that's on uh, that's on YouTube or LinkedIn or right here in, in the Zoom room. And I'll add you to the queue. Uh, let's go to Russell. Uh, Russell, are you uh, able to, his, his, uh, his audio might be going through some issues. Um, how about Manny or Abe? Do you guys want to share something derpy? Super, super what? Derpy? Super derpy, man. Just derpy, like a, a silly mistake. Just to, Oh, you know. um, and like the last hour or? <laughs> no, last week, I guess the last hour counts as part of uh, the week. So, so that, that works as well. Like any, in, in regards to like just anything or data related? Uh, just regards to anything. Like I was talking about how earlier I was trying to do some prospecting. So I was sending out emails to people trying to see if they want to do some sponsorship for the podcast. And I, uh, I have a template that I use. And instead of, you know, changing the bracket name, I left it in more than one email uh, as opposed to, to changing it. Yeah. So, that's derpy AF. Yes, that is. That's quite derpy. Um, what did I do this week? Uh, I don't, I I always drop stuff and I'm clumsy when my wife tells me not to break stuff. So that's like that's like every day though. Manny, how about you? Um, nothing that I can think of right now. This week I'm off. Uh, I'm transitioning jobs right now, so. A few weeks ago, though, I did mess up a. Uh, I sent a message to LinkedIn. Uh, I was connecting with someone, and I messed up the introduction. And I don't even think they noticed, but I just let that slide by. But I, I know for sure I saw the mistake afterwards, and I'm like, God, I'm an idiot. It happens, Dad. <laughs> it happens. Uh, Russell, I think your audio is back on, or was it a bit glitchy? I was not able to tell. Uh, yeah, I think it's back on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Good to speak to you again. Last week, I think I was I was wiped out for the entire session. Um, so I don't think there's anything I've done this week, but there, there's a, a good one from my past that I remember. Um, whilst working in the office, you know, back in the days that we'd actually go into the office, uh, working on a docking station, I always carry around my own um, cordless or wireless mouse and keyboard uh, to use with my my setup because we had like a hot desking system at the main office uh, and um, was working and the, uh, the, the screen was doing some real weird stuff and couldn't figure out what was happening. And it, it turned out that there was still a keyboard plugged in 
to the docking station that someone had stuck on top of a pedestal beneath the desk and then someone had put a book on it. So the, the weight of the book was constantly pressing down the key. Uh, so a real stupid thing that we should have been able to, to diagnose in a few seconds, but it, three of us sat around for about five minutes trying to figure out what was going on before we realized it was such a, you know, a new mistake. So look out for those. Eric says you got another one. Eric, uh, go for it. And then if you guys have questions, go ahead. Let me know right there in the chat or the comment section, wherever it is that you are joining us from. Shout out to everybody watching us on LinkedIn and on YouTube. I see you guys. Uh, I'm taking your questions, so let us know. Go for it, Eric. Yeah, so Manny's uh, thing reminded me. I, once upon a time, had a group of uh, people came to my master's program to share some stuff about, about the company. And one of them was a recruiter and then some other people like directors and things like that. And I really enjoyed it, took lots of good notes. And I messaged, I, I messaged the recruiter afterwards um, later when I was interested in applying, you know, like a couple months later or whatever. And so this actually was for Lending Tree, the company I work for. And uh, earlier in the program, we had used the Lending Club data set for a different project. And I wrote this nice like note out to the recruiter and I accidentally in one spot, I said lending club and the other part I said lending tree. And he responded back and he's like, oh, did you mean lending club or lending tree? And I just like, I just said, I just responded real quick. I was like, oh man, sorry. I meant lending tree. That was stupid, blah, blah, blah. He never responded to me, never. I just like got ghosted from there, but still got the job. Ended up talking to somebody else and, and found my way around, but I felt so stupid about it. But I was like, yeah, whatever. Like if it's going to work out, it's going to work out. If not, then that's whatever, you know, that's his, yeah. his choice. But it just made me think like, I guess that's why it's important to one proofread, but to keep multiple irons in the fire um, when talking to people and just be a good, be human. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, something to be said about um, you being on the receiving end of someone else's derpiness is, you know, how uh, compassionate or empathetic to that mistake do you want to be? I guess in my case, uh, where I'm prospecting people <laughs> trying to get them to, to pay money to my podcast, uh, probably not as much uh, uh, leniency there. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to some questions. I know that uh, Eric said he had a question lined up. I think Abe had a question lined up as well, but we'll start with Antonio's question first. It's right here at the uh, at the very top, go for it, Antonio. Sure. So uh, I hope you guys don't hate me because I know like a lot of people get annoyed because it's all over. Like, if, I mean, especially if you use Twitter or stuff, I don't see it too much on LinkedIn. But how interested are you personally in like NFT space? And also more to this um, uh, office hours, do you see any applications for it in the, in the data field? Uh, so I'd love to hear from multiple people. I think Ben, I want to hear him out from like a data perspective, but it's just, I, I, it's just such a big space right now. Um, I want to see what you guys think. Yeah, let's go to Ben. I mean, me personally, like I find them fascinating. I find it interesting. I, I don't think they're going anywhere just because I think humans like collecting stuff. That's always going to be an aspect of it, just the human element. Um, I don't know enough about them to comment on the data aspect of stuff. I was, you know, interested, intellectually curious about blockchain for a while, but I had to deprioritize that for, for other things. But uh, let's go to Ben and see what Ben has to say. I think you're on mute. Oh, oh. Ben's having some audio hey. issues. Um, <laughs> while Ben comes back, does anybody else have any uh, thoughts on NFTs? You can hear me now. Okay. Yes. I, had to, awesome. I had to push the on button on my <laughs> on my microphone. Um, so I, I have a project in Q4 that I'm hoping to get approved where we would be producing an NFT just for fun, but like an, an AI produced NFT, which other people have done, but we'd like to take it to the next level as far as practical applications. I haven't put my hands deep into it to have a strong opinion. It's, a lot of the stuff I do is more like marketing stunt with a, some MSG of AI sprinkled on. But anyway, I'm curious what other people say. Yeah, same here. Speaking of marketing stunt, uh, how's that crazy expedition you went on with the fly fishing? Anything I'll, interesting I'll, with that? I'll, I'll post a video in the chat. So I went last Saturday and the hike is twice as long as I told everyone, which I think is hilarious. And it's not moderate, it's strenuous. 
which I think is also hilarious. So, but yeah, we're still going forward. So got an awesome videographer, photographer. It's going to be an amazing shoot. And I'm doing testing this weekend, it's like technical testing on the doability, uh, filming, you know, teaching an AI system to predict if you're going to catch a fish. So, yeah, I'm super excited. It's excited to see what comes of that. Cause that sounds very, very fascinating. I'd love yeah, I'll post a link in the chat. I think when you guys see like the footage of where we're actually going, you'll realize why this is insane. Yeah. Which... Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on, on NFTs? Andrew, how about you or uh, Mexico or Manny NFTs and you know, the relation to, to data, if anybody has any thoughts. I do have a question for the group and maybe extending on what Ben just mentioned. So I was playing around with the VQGAN clip uh, notebooks, which have been really popular lately. And I was curious if anyone's uh, thought or heard or seen anything in the space about using it to customize experiences in games, because I know it'd be pretty, it'd be pretty neat if instead of getting like a platinum trophy in a PS4 game when I, you know, kick some alien uh, ass in like Mass Effect or something, that I get a trophy that's also like an, an NFT. Because um, I was thinking originally of like customized art based on like prompts you could do in games and everything from the clip, but the NFT style trophy would be pretty cool too. Well, yeah, I, I think where I was thinking about users, so Harpreet uh, or people who do courses online, somebody can buy your course once, let's say for $300, right? They use it for two weeks and they don't want it anymore. Well, maybe they learn what they needed. Well, with an NFT, you can sell the course to somebody else. So that way you as the learner, you don't feel like, for example, that you're like, well, I just dropped $300 on per pre and now like I lost that money. Well, if somebody else wants it, you can buy that. But what's good for her pre because it will work for you, you can attach, let's say, a 10% royalty on that. So now if your podcast starts becoming bigger, be more people want it, maybe you don't have too much time to, to mentor everybody. So now the only way for you, somebody to get a personal session with her pre is through this one NFT. And ideally in that, the price keeps going up. You keep, people keep selling it, right? And then so that they're not feeling like they're just dropping money without anything in return. Other, I mean, yeah, you're, they're still learning something, but you are making now royalties forever. So you're kind of betting on yourself. Um, so that was kind of like one idea that came to mind, right? Because I know the artwork piece is like, yeah, like a lot of, it's a lot of hype and what could happen. Um, but that's kind of like one of the ideas that came to my mind is in terms of selling your course. Or what if like Ben designs some kind of a data set and it's like one of a kind data set and he doesn't want to give it out for free. So he drops it as an NFT and people like basically compete and Ben keeps getting royalties for the next 30 years when somebody uses this NFT, you know? So uh, I've been very, I'm, I'm still learning about it, but I wanted to bring it up in case somebody else is like interested in it. But if not, we'll we'll talk about it in another another session. I don't want to stop the conversation. Yeah, my yeah, friend, out there. my friend showed me earlier Royal.io, and it's like the same thing, but it's like for artists, like getting away from labels. Um, yeah. So, like, I just looked at it, and they're not starting it yet till October, but it looks pretty interesting. Like, you get a royalty from like Mariah Carey's Christmas song. I don't I don't know how much it is, but I mean that'll be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty okay. fascinating. I like that. I like that. Uh, that's an interesting use case, almost like the, the used textbook market kind of like, okay, you're done learning this thing. Let's see if we can resell it. Man, where's Carlos when you need him? Uh, but Eric, sounds like you were uh, uh, yeah. jumping in there. It's one thing that I think is interesting is I think that NFTs are kind of a, a little bit of a solution in search of a problem at the moment, right? Because we we have, the only thing we know how to sell with them is the digital equivalent of baseball cards, right? At the moment. But like, so I dropped a, I dropped a post or a blog post from um, Not Boring, um, which I actually got from a post from Carlos on LinkedIn, where he talks about using NFTs as status symbols and stuff. And so that's kind of, it's an interesting thing that's basically showing the current futility of the use of, of NFTs. However, he also the author kind of gets into a little bit of what like the 
the metaverse kind of thing is going to look like. And I personally think like, I try not to get too into the metaverse as a, as a buzzword type thing, but I'm, I've been really interested in VR for a few years. And so seeing the progression that's been made towards like Facebook's um, horizon uh, workspaces and things where you can even actually like see your keyboard, even though you have your VR headset on and things like that. Right. So as we move towards ready player one type world where I can be in a digital space and I may have digital possessions that you cannot just digitally copy and paste into your digital space, then a non-fungible token will be the way you prove your ownership, I think. And so eventually it will matter. For now, it's just a tool that you don't know how to use because the world doesn't have a use case quite ready yet for it. But I think that we will get there. Um, but for now, yeah, for now it's like just speculate if you want to buy cartoon art or whatever but i i do really think that it will have a purpose once the rest of the technology that we will actually want to use kind of catches up yeah i heard ralph lauren got uh, nfts you know for for polo uh gear so i should just stock up on some polo threads for my virtual self um but no that's really really fascinating really interesting eric uh, i'd really like to uh to, to see that blog post you mentioned so if you could drop a link to that man i really appreciate that Nikiko, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm sort of, what's the term, bearish on NFTs. I don't know. I, I've been I've been following some like trader, like meme Instagram handles recently. And I'm like, ooh, all these things that I used to know and I don't know, but they're really funny to poke fun of like Excel sheets. Um, don't tell David Langer I said that, by the way. Um, but I think NFTs, like exactly to what Eric was saying, like they become more useful when you start talking about them like in like specific domains. And when you talk about them in the vision of like, what does this future world look like? Because I feel like NFTs are kind of this like weird, like next step in evolution of what was the like various attempts to, you know, create sort of like virtual worlds, either through Sims or like other games, like other life, for example, was another, well, yeah, that, like it's an extension of, of almost sort of like that sort of belief of like why don't we create the sort of like unified world vision um where exactly like as eric pointed out like digital like proving possession of, of digital items becomes really important and actually even in like the luxury space like for example like lvmh is this like you know monster portfolio company that owns various brands like um uh, I think Chanel, Dior, a couple others, um, but like they have some teams that are specifically, for example, looking at, well, how can we create essentially um, like digital clothing? And when you think about it, you're like, okay, that is definitely like Emperor's New Clothes until you realize how much of the revenue is actually driven by influencers and actually by like social media and through sort of like the production of digital media, at which point then it's like, okay, it becomes really interesting for now. Um, some people could say like, well, you could take that, for example, that that mesh of the clothing, right? So, so in this case, the NFT would be like the mesh, like the clothing mesh with all the designs and all that. And you could screenshot it and then sort of like Photoshop it onto something else. It becomes a lot more interesting when you start talking about like the AR VR aspect of it, or even the fact that like a lot of media nowadays is video or sort of TikTok shorts, and you can't just kind of like copy pasta stuff. And so... <clears throat> And so like, it's one of these things where it's like various sort of industries are like adopting it in sort of, you know, some people are like, yes, this is an exciting new technology because we kind of see a lot of, for example, like business and like fashion and art going digital. Um, but then you also have like a lot of people like myself where it's like, yeah, there's like just a hundred percent no use case for it. And it's almost like in the realm of art where like, it's hard to like put a dollar value on subjective tastes. Um, until like the artist dies, at which point then it always goes up by like 10, 15 million at a auction at like Sotheby's or Christie's or whatever, right? So, but yeah, like that, yeah. Thank you, Makiko. Uh, I like what Russell said, uh, her pre, he said, if you could use those NFT slash smart contracts to verify like data set ownership and things like that. Russell, he's dropping some good comments, but he's staying quiet maybe due to his microphone issues. Yeah, I think that might might have something to do with it. Um, there's a lot of great great comments in the chat, and you, dear viewer, on LinkedIn could too be part of this wonderful scintillating conversation that is happening in the chat. If you join the room, 
a question from I see Anti. I'm not sure if you're uh, your microphone ready as well, but Anti's got some interesting comments and questions. He says, "Where does blockchain end and NFTs begin? Do we talk about one and mean the other? I think NFTs are just an implementation of blockchain, just like Zoom call would be an implementation of the internet. I guess I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but I hope you kind of get what I mean. Uh, ben, go for it. I, I was just I was laughing because Mikiko said something important uh, that I've I thought about with these a if you have a like AI artists in the future that are quite good, the AI artists in the future becomes more interesting when you destroy it. So imagine like you're you're training this system with all of this compute and you generate this piece of art, and then you intentionally destroy the system. I, I don't know that that's maybe laugh laugh in the past based on the point that you just brought up. Future Banksy, AI Banksy. That's right. Watch me shred my AI. I mean, but can you actually ever like fully destroy the AI if we still have the source code, right? Like, it depends on the complexity, yeah. I think. Because yeah. um, if you don't, if you haven't saved off those weights and you've just hashed it, you can. I don't know. I, I think you could come up with a scenario where it's just it's too hard to get. You can get similar, but it'd be too hard to guarantee that you had achieved an identical. Yeah, there's too many too many possibilities. Yeah, so I was, I'm still listening to Max Tegmark's book, Life 3.0. It's so fascinating, such an interesting uh, book. Highly encourage all you guys to, to check it out. He just uh, just throws out a bunch of possible scenarios that, that could happen with, with AI in the future. And there's something that he was talking about was just AIs having subjective experience, right? So typically when we think of an artist who's making art, he's making that art from some place, right? Some subjective experiences pushing him to make that art. Is that the case with with AI? Is like the AI and like emo teenager angst painting this crazy artwork or making these you know crazy riffs on power chords? I don't know, man. Um, it's a really interesting thing about. I mean, I can't wait for the future for one. Um, any other points on this topic of NFTs? Uh, I see a bunch of wonderful comments in the uh, chat. I'm not going to scroll through all of them. Um, Intersubjective with GANs. Uh, no. Andrew, talk, talk to us no. about that. Oh, Tom. No, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't know someone else was lined up. Yeah, I think that's this. Inter oh, can you uh, elaborate on this? Intersubjective with GANs. Well, no, you just said uh, like subjective experiences with yeah. uh, an AI, mm -hmm. then it feels like a GAN is like a, it could be like a, a micro of like intersubjective experiences between like an, yeah. uh, like between some sort of ensemble model, like yeah. to take the DQ GAN clip uh, again, that's like a, almost like an intersubjective interpretation of two models working together. It's just an ensemble model. I could be overthinking it, but. <laughs> so you say intersubjective, like the sense that how like Noah Harari talks about it in his book, Sapiens, like, like how money, how NFTs are really an intersubjective reality. We're all, most yeah, of it's coming yeah it's kind of like a mix of like Karl popper and, and what you're talking about yeah. Yeah. yeah interesting stuff to think about uh tom you were saying something so go for it oh just a real quick thought when we're talking these nfts now that i know what we're talking about i actually had a friend doing a startup with a, a concept like this for music but i think the bigger picture and i'm guessing this is on ethereum when we talk this way is that right because that seems like the better way to do it. Well, if you don't know, that's fine. But I think this is one of those things where the elephant is there, but it's behind the bushes and no one can see it. That type of blockchain that has smart contracts and can do these kind of things, this is just one example. I think we've not learned to exploit blockchain or smart contracts well enough yet. I think that's where this group should remain open as we talk about this over the coming months, years, or decades. Um, just, just thinking out loud to say, this is a, a first interesting topic, but it's really, what is the foundation that makes it possible? It's, it's this new technology of blockchain slash smart contracts. Yeah, yeah definitely uh, something I'm, I'm interested in uh but again had to, had to deprioritize studying it but just having a conceptual understanding of the basics i think enough to have some mental hooks and maybe enough to just kind of think about how it could affect or impact your work as a data scientist or machine learning practitioner um next question 
was coming from I think Eric, you said in a comment for today's uh, pose, uh, today's meeting that you had a question. So let's let's go to you. Cool. So yeah, it's <clears throat> I'm the analytics or part of the uh, organization. You know, the lending tree is has grown quite a bit uh, recently, and and I suspect that this is like a thing in in other companies as well. I'm just curious to know what different people have experienced, whether you're on the, you know, uh, more tenured side of it or the new person coming into the company side of it from uh, like, just from like a, a SQL, just like a SQL standpoint, not like trying to get to know some code base of like functional scripty things, but just like, how do you, what are kind of your best practices for sharing starter material? Do you use Confluence? Do you use GitLab, GitHub? Is it kind of like, a, you know, to use a Star Wars metaphor, is it like a Jedi where everybody has to build their own lightsaber? You know, it's like, here, I'll kind of tell you some stuff and you go out and build your own starter queries or, you know, what, what tools have you used and what, what's most successful? And yeah, just kind of open-ended on that. Yeah, so from my experience being, you know, a founding member on two data science teams, like, uh, when I was at Bold, we did use Confluence, just a nice little wiki, and just really started outlining stuff and outlining the work that we we're doing um, with a focus on the future. Like, okay, here's some important things. Here's where they live. Here's what these things mean, and just documenting all of that. Um, and then we'd have like a consensus. Like we'd, we'd submit submit it on Confluence, and then somebody has to to review it and approve it uh, at price i was doing everything inside teams so we had this really comprehensive built out this really comprehensive wiki on teams and it was just you know being a foundational founding member of a data science team it was a lot of best practices for like okay this is how we're going to structure our repositories this is how we name our files this is how we're going to work through data science problems it's going to be a pipeline our workflow um and then things like that i'm not sure if i'm answering your question uh, eric but i'd love to hear from uh, from other folks and i guess we could start with uh Antonio, and then maybe go to uh, to to Makiko or, or Ben. And if anybody else would like to chime in on this, by all means, let me know, and I'll go ahead and uh, add you to the queue. I see Joe is here. I did not notice Joe is here. Uh, Joe would love to hear from you uh, as well. But let's start with uh, Antonio. Yeah, sure. So when I was on the BI team, what we did is we wanted to get the non-technical folks involved, and we already were we were running Teradata SQL, right? So you can be running SQL Server, whatever it is. And we created like uh, six six lessons from beginning to advance in like PowerPoint slides. And first one is basically like, okay, just what is a database um, and how to like how to download SQL and how to get access to it at work. And then afterwards, we created trainings off of the basic tables that we use, like customer tables or employee tables that we were working with. So it was uh, kind of like guiding through and with real examples. So it's like, hey, if you ever want to look up customer information, don't go to the BI person. You can actually open SQL. You do select star from this table and open that. So and progressively kind of like make different kinds of videos. And then we, we put those videos like on a, like on, you can put on a Confluence page or we like on a shared network. And afterwards, every time somebody wanted to learn SQL, just send them the videos and let them learn. And what we also did at the end of each one, there would be like, you put like a couple of practice problems if they want to practice. And once a week on a Friday between like, let's say the hours of like one and two, we hosted office hours so that if anybody uh, wasn't sure they had any questions, that one hour a week, they can come in and ask questions. So then, it was it was it was pretty successful. So, cool idea. Uh, ben, Joe, or Makiko, any any of you guys want to chime in here? Ben, I'll pass on this one. Yeah. Joe, uh, were you able oh. to hear the question? I'm not sure when you joined in. Yeah, I mean, it, it's we're going through this right now at our company, actually uh, leveling up people and. Um, trying to share knowledge and skills. I would say videos are good, like especially if you find yourself doing workflows where it's, um, I would say more than once, like make a video so you can share it with people. I think like showing people how to do stuff is a really good way to do it. Um, I'm a big fan of like uh, putting th stuff together in links as well or documents with lots of links and having people read through that their first day just so they can 
kind of level set, but making sure everyone has common knowledge, I think is the most important thing. There's nothing worse than um, starting off on the wrong foot and everyone is, um, has different uh, skill sets. I'm actually about to send a client right now where the skill sets are all across the board and that's going to be fun trying to level everybody up to the same place. Looking forward to that. I'm joking. <laughs> Yeah, Andrew, uh, I see some great uh, comments here. Uh, go for it. Uh, learning is generally messy. You know, it depends on the team and the audience. It's always about your audience. But you know, generally, we've used Wiki. Sometimes that's been in Teams. Sometimes it's been um, elsewhere. Lots of links, which you can gauge interest by, which is kind of key if you want to figure out which members of the team really want to skill up. And then uh, we do a lot of stuff. Um, I've been teaching a lot of people Python. So lots of sharing notebooks, you know, get, getting someone on their first Jupyter notebook is always like a rite of passage if they've just joined the team, just to make sure they, they can do it. And then live sessions and brown bags, like focused on particular topics. You know, they, again, there's like nothing better than one-on-one -on -one, um, or like a live session. Yeah, like pair, pair programming type of sessions are always always good eric i'll turn it back over to you for any follow-up that's all that's that's definitely really helpful i particularly like the uh being able to set up whether it's a like you said like powerpoint thing or put it into a video format or a little bit of both um just to make sure that they're because i just think it's so valuable even if i could you know record myself like writing up a query and talk through stuff that i wouldn't necessarily think to teach but as somebody like says it because that's how i learned it if somebody's like oh and this table would be connected to this because blah 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 i was like wait say that again write that down like i like you know so i i really like i really like that because it helps capture some of that institutional knowledge that maybe you wouldn't think if you were just typing it so thank you very much Spencer asking what's what's a brown bag uh there's like lunch and learns where you just bring your own own lunch and learn yeah hopefully you actually get to eat that's yeah. the thing people forget to do yeah so uh let's turn it over and see if there's any other questions or comments on any other particular topic i don't see anything coming in on linkedin or in the chat uh so if anybody wants to uh to ask a question now is the perfect time to do so then go for it so Harpreet, you mentioned something earlier that is a really fun topic, and that is experience-driven knowledge. So with AI systems of the future, uh, Anima from NVIDIA, we had her on our podcast. So she's kind of an AGI expert, and she's a professor at um, Caltech, I think. And I asked her if we'll be able to understand these AGI systems of the future. You know, with because it people on the call were like, well, we have storytelling with deep learning, grad cam, we have all these great tools. And she said, absolutely not. And the and she leaned into this experience thing. The only way that you could understand a system like this would be if you could comprehend its, its experience through time. And which I think is a really fun discussion because anyone on the call, if we happen to be clones of each other, I actually can't understand you. Like I, I could guess what how you might be feeling and thinking, but like I would actually have to live your life through your shoes which which i think is fascinating because anyway it's just a yeah. fun topic of conversation whether it's ai or you know just humans in general like experience driven insights and knowledge are what, fascinating. what what ben is saying is scientifically proven by a star trek next generation episode where Riker <laughs> was split into two <laughs> beings and separated for an entire decade and then when the two of them met totally different so it's it perfectly well founded what ben just said it reminds me of a quote when i was reading this this listening to rather this max Tegmark book he he uh maybe it was his own quote or he was quoting somebody else but essentially he said like if a lion could talk we just wouldn't be able to, to understand it and i think it's the same kind of thing just the experience of it um it looks like russell has a, a comment here i'd love to, to hear from you so go so go for it russell so I had a kind of a comment to loop back to um, Antonio's uh, initial question about NFTs. Is it a good time to, to, to throw this back or do you want to carry on with the, uh, the current theme? Uh, anybody, I, I mean, I'd love to talk about either or. So uh, anybody want to talk about AI experience, experience based learning and AI's experience thing, experiencing things? Cause... I would throw Russell's point in because it's, you know, it's top of mind for him. Let's, let's go back to that. Like, okay. And then 
people yeah. want to okay, sure. fall down uh, the AGI rabbit hole, we can go back to that. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, going to fall down that rabbit hole as well. So, Russell, let's go to your question. Then after that, um, uh, we can go back down the rabbit hole. And if anybody has questions, whether you're watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch even, or if you're here in the Zoom room with us, please let me know in the uh, chat. Go for it, Russell. I'll make it real quick, and uh, hopefully this might uh, generate some some additional um, uh, questions related to AI. Uh, I, so I, I put a comment in the uh, in the chat a little while ago. Um, I've just recently watched a, a documentary on the Wu Tang Clan. It was it was quite a long documentary, but it, uh, one of the big parts in it was this. Um, uh, once upon a time in Shaolin, I think the album was called. It was this one one of a kind album that they put in this kind of bejeweled, polished metal case, uh, and it, it ended up being bought by you know someone we might not want to talk about because you know, and, and as I said in the in the chat, you know, he had dubious ethics and, and such. But uh, the point I was making was that could be done nowadays with an NFT. It needn't be a physical edifice, but if it wasn't. Do you think it would have sold for so much? Do you think it would have generated as much interest in this modern digital age? I tend to think that it might. But if it was an NFT, do you think they'd say, yeah, you've got the ownership of it, but people can still listen to it, much like they've done with the NFT artworks? I think it would, just because it's like super hype right now. And if Wu-Tang you know, did something like, like a publicity stunt like that, coupled with uh, hype technology, it would, it, it would definitely blow up. Uh, but I like that analogy. That's a, that's a good analogy. Um, any comments on this? I'd love to hear from folks. It kind of loops. I, I hope this doesn't seem so far out, but it feels like it loops back around to this experiential AI. If you could somehow NFT a certain AI's experience, it's a giant model, then you could transfer it to another AI and say, yeah, I'd like to experience this AI now and instead and put on the shelf the one I had been running. It's, it's quite fascinating because then if you think of, okay, these different AIs have different experiences, we, we can open source some of them and share them or we can trade them for a, check them out for a short time, all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, it's super fascinating. I think the, the Wu Tang Clan, doesn't matter if it was electronic or not, I think, it still would go for that much. It's like it's like a first edition copy of a book, right? Whether it's electronic or not, is yeah, you can have 10 million people who read it, but it's that human thing in us who we want, you know, like as a social status or something that you're like, hey, I was like the first one, or I was the only one who has this official first release uh, copy. So I, I, it's a fascinating space. Any other uh, comments on, on that? Uh, Albert, were you saying something? I just started lip move, but I don't, I don't know if you're talking to us or. No, sorry about that. I'm uh, <laughs> financing a car for my son. So. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, anybody else? Uh, discussion on this NFT topic? Does not look like it. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. If anybody has questions, go ahead. Let me know. If anybody wants to comment and carry on uh, on the thread that that uh, Ben had unraveled there. Ben, talk to me a little bit more about that. So we're talking about. I guess kind of reframe the question in in a way that would be easier for a dumb person like me to understand. Yes, and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I I guess you can think. When you, when you think of conscious AI or sentient or AGI, there's this continuous scale. So you can imagine if I have a Roomba that is rewarded for searching for novelty. So it's kind of, it's curious, it's trying to learn new categories. And it's, it's stuff that we can all explain. You're like, okay, you're doing some data collection. You're doing some unsupervised deep learning. You have this novelty reward where you're trying to measure the Euclidean distance based on things it's seen. And it has this reward function, but you can imagine this thing existing in my home for a couple months. If I drop something new or my kids make a mess, there's some type of personification or way it behaves, but the way that it behaves is really driven by its experience. Like the way that it goes hunting for novelty, the way that it is going to pay attention to like, I, I put a new plant in my house and now this little thing is like very interested in this plant. 
but if I lived in a different universe with a different, you know, there's so much stochasticness to it, right? So I just think that's interesting that you can you can have this intermediate thing that feels alive. You can be like, wow, like look at this little thing that's got a personality. But everyone on this call would be like, no, it doesn't. Like you're just kind of it's the parlor trick. So it's that parlor trick going from I could make AGI this year that would fool my parents, but that's like the bottom one percent of the tech population. But that fraction will start going up. And then eventually we'll get to like the 98 and the 99 percent where now you have a lot of AI professionals that are like deep and heated debates and they are the top one percent in the AI community arguing about whether or not this counts. Um, so I I know that's kind of this meandering thought, but I, I just laugh thinking about will AGI in the future just be a parlor trick where you no know, Ben, it makes me forgive me. I'm fascinated by what you're saying. And I I get fixated on watching these latest, greatest magicians on America and Britain's got talent. They're they're just mind-bogglingly good, like Shin Lim and uh, uh, help me. There's another one that's just they they blow away the David Copperfields and all those guys from the past. And and thinking, are we going to get that good at our arts to where we fool people with our AI? It because I agree with you, Ben. We're nowhere near AGI, and if we if we get if if we get to what looks like it, it's a parlor trick. It's not, I don't, I don't think it's real. I yeah. think you put it on pin and teller and they'll go, yeah, but. <laughs> well, the one distinction that's different than the way norm, people normally think about AI is you really have to go back to how the kid, how a child learns a language, right? So like a child, it learns through focus-based learning. And so um, a, a child can't learn a language listening to the radio. And as a parent, you hold up your kid and within a few weeks, they're eye tracking you and you celebrate as a parent. You're like, oh my gosh, they're eye tracking me. Isn't this great? And it's like, no, they're like in full on, I'm going to learn everything from you and everything that you're looking at. And we don't teach them. We don't go to school on how to teach a kid a language, but they just, their brains are so good at focus-based learning. So I imagine an AI system in the future is very much focused on you. So you're walking through the home, you're doing different things. It, you're interacting with your coffee and it's focused. So it's, yeah, the I, I see Makiko has her hand raised. I really, really want to hear what she has to say about this topic or a different topic. Oh, yeah, is it because I'm gonna? Yeah. Is it because I'm gonna bring my liberal arts training into it and start going like, well, you know, this philosopher, this philosopher said. Uh. <laughs> but but that's the thing, right? Like, I feel like a lot of these questions about. So, like, one question I would almost ask is like, if you had AGI, like walking down the street and it slapped you in the face, would you even recognize it? Right. Like, would you even recognize it was AGI? And then at that point, it's like, would you even care? Like, maybe you're someone who, I don't want to say gets their rocks off getting slapped, but um, maybe you're someone who, uh, the way you engage with that AGI, like, it does certain actions and behaviors. It lines up with with just what you would anticipate someone, sort of how they would communicate with you and engage with you. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a New Yorker right there. Yeah, from the east side, 100%. Um, but then like, let's say you come up against, uh, let's say someone, for example, who their persona is not that of someone born in New York and grown up in, in Brooklyn and all that, but they maybe actually came from like San Francisco and you're talking to them and you're like, wow. And let's say you're a New Yorker, right? And you're like, wow, these West coasters are really weird. They're almost like not even human. Like they're so slow and they're so chill and laid back. And so it's one of these things where like, I think at some point, um, I don't know if people are almost going to care about whether or not there's a real human being on the other side, as long as kind of they get something out of it, you know? And, and it was interesting, like there was a, I think I need to track down this like blog post, but someone had done the study on children who had like Alexas or series like in their room and I think at age three or four, like they thought that there was a person, right? Like in the Alexa or Siri, um, which is fine. Like most kids think that, right? Like I too once believed Santa Claus came and left cookies on the counter, even though they were the same flavor as my dad's favorite cookies. I never figured that one out, you know? Um, but like, but it, and that's thing, like, I feel like in some ways, a lot of these questions are so fundamental because for example, on like the anthro side, right? Like anytime, for example, someone reports like, oh, we, we've seen this macaque using a tool 
to dig stuff out of the ground. They're like, oh, is that culture? Oh, is that like learning? Is that intentional behavior? And then if you start seeing like two or three generations of like monkeys or apes doing that, then they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when they start arguing like, okay, this is culture. This is like a behavior. This is X, Y, Z, um, you know? And so like, it is like even within, within anthropology, like when we look at living beings and they exhibit different behaviors, we kind of want to, to some degree, like imbue their behaviors with a certain perspective to some degree based on incentive. Because if you report, for example, this is a new learned behavior that shows culture and um, transmitting knowledge, then you get a paper published. Whereas if you, you know, whereas if you're like, oh yeah, they kind of just like started with that and they just kind of went with it because it was like the main thing that everyone was doing. Um, since it's an, it, since it might not be intentional, like is it is it learning? Is it is it culture at that point? So I mean, I don't know. And I think the part that sort of I wonder about is still that you know, let's say for example, you're walking down the street, you get slapped by an AGI, or or maybe they don't do that. Like maybe they just hand you money, and then let's say for example, there's a bill going on saying like, okay, well, you know, we need to make sure that these AGIs don't have rights. Like at that point, are you, will you argue for, let's say AGIs having more rights if it means you get a better experience or do you kind of stick with the, like, what is, was human, you know? Sorry. I think about this a lot. Yeah. Liberal arts background, right? I mean, how, how do we define intelligence? I guess, I guess that would be something to, uh, get on equal footing to make sure we're talking about the same thing, right? So when we talk about intelligence, what, what is it that makes something intelligent? You're able to acquire new knowledge through experience. Okay. So, so yeah, do you, there's, yeah. there, there, there's some very dumb things that are intelligent. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think, too, the ability to conceive of things never thought of and actually get them to work. Uh, machines can't do anything like that right now. By the way, the zone we're entering in right now, here verbally and in the chat, I keep asking people, if you wanna talk about AGI, can we ask the right questions so we can try to begin to get some more together? I feel like this is the first group of people I've been with that started to approach that right now at this moment. Thank you, Tom. Um, Andrew, what do you think? Love to hear from, from Andrew here. Uh, if anybody else wants to chime in here, definitely go for it. Um, but yeah, like that, that's just so, so so saying the ability to, uh, learn requires skills. That's kind of like the, the Oxford de definition of, of intelligence. So, um, like I was watching a documentary on, it's called Wild Sri Lanka yesterday. And they're talking about these giant sperm whales. And these sperm whales are like floating around thousands and thousands of miles. And these really old ass turtles that are just floating around. Are they intelligent? I was asking myself this question. I was like, is that constitute intelligence? Are those things intelligent? Um, is, is intelligence different from, from sentience? I don't know. Is consciousness? Uh, anyways, uh, I, I digress. I, well, I get, oh, sorry, Antonio, here you go. I was just gonna say the the life three dot zero that Harpreet talked about. It goes like if AI is running the world, how can we know or understand that they are going to like they're going to create some future that we won't even understand? So how can we be sure if it's good or bad for us? Like they can have some kind of a concept. So advanced that we're going to be like what the heck i thought this was good for me and it might be good for us as humans but like i don't know i just think those things can it can learn so fast in theory and like advance so much that uh we'll never be able to comprehend kind of like but does that become like i don't know now that like you're driving me down it ends up to me as religious because you know how they like everything happens for a reason and you say, so, you know, if you're religious, you're like, okay, God, like this, there's reason why this happened. Well, then does the AI become God that you don't understand? And everything that you're doing is like, I don't know, the AI God said, I, this is, should happen and it's happening. So do we still, do we end up with another 
unknown, like, I guess, sacred thing that we don't understand. I mean, and then you just blindly trust it be, or you trust it because you're like, well, this is, this is above, above me. And this is, this is beyond me. Do you turn AI into some kind of God? Well, there, there is a topic about AI religion and exactly that point, Antonio, because the AI in the future will be so complicated, so complex. You will have a fraction of humans that align in worship that. And I think there already is an AI religion. I, I'm not part of it, by the way. Our, our Preet is going to say real quick to um, intelligence. It's nice to think, think of that as a conti continuous scale. And so when you look in the animal kingdom, the dumbest layer of intelligence is you're hungry. And then you go above that and you can actually have fear. Like you're worried about something else hurting you. And if you go up through all those layers, I almost like thinking of the brain as like a, an onion or like, you know, these layers. So if you go up all those layers, you then get to, you look at dolphins and elephants and people where we are social creatures and we share, we share experience. We have language, we um, have empathy, compassion, you know, a member of our tribe dies. We actually care where I argue like a shark who has, you know, a very small brain probably doesn't give a crap about like, Oh my, like um, dolphins and elephants will actually show um, you know, they, they will show grief where, you know, imagine like if a shark watched its friend get cut up, it could care less five minutes later. Um, not that I know what a shark thinks, but you look at like the size of the brain and the behavior. So if aliens came to earth, they of course would be more intelligent than us because they were able to, uh, you can think of like a two dimensional scale, uh, your understanding of space and time. So humans, we understand, we, hopefully we understand time further than other animals do. Like the, we actually can have conversations about where we're going to be in three years or are we going to go to Mars? But if aliens come here, they're naturally, they should be more intelligent than us because they've been able to, you know, make this jump, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily conscious. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess that's a really weird thing that people could kind of throw back on that sometimes we think consciousness is a required check mark for things that are very intelligent, but you have all of these different elements um, yeah, anyway, yeah, let's go to, to, to Andrew here. Just such a fascinating conversation. Um, I uh, want to go back to like one of the earliest memories that I have, like when I'm always thinking about what does intelligence mean? What is self-awareness sentience, which I've thought a lot about because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So I'm <laughs> like Thomas, um, I think back, I was in a math class and I think I was in, might have been second, third, fourth grade. And for the first time, I remember realizing that the young woman who sat in the seat in front of me had thoughts in her head and had goals that were individually distinctive from mine and that they deserved respect just as much as my own like actions and desires and outcomes and my own drives. And that quality of there's a self-awareness, but then there's a leap to also empathy and I don't want to go into like the area of like human dignity. That's not right. But that there's, um, uh, there's something special in like the diverse perspective, the diverse like self-awareness that different individuals have. And like, that's, that's the thing where I get into boundaries, like sentient self-awareness. I can kind of see those being translated in like the evolution of certain things that we're conceiving now. But the empathy concept, the allowing another uh, intelligence to give it the deference that its objectives are just as valid as mine. That's where I get into really like, complicated, <laughs> moralistic <laughs> territory that I don't understand. So I'd be interested in anybody's perspectives on that. Uh, anyone take a stab at this? This is a definitely interesting conversation and um... I love it, yeah. Andrew. Yeah. I don't think anyone in any AGI conversations I've heard has touched on, hey, will a group of AIs seek to form a community and benefit from one another? Now that's next level AGI thinking. The empathy part too. Will they want to empathize with us and will they appreciate that we brought them into existence if we even can create AGI, by the way? But it, it's a fun thought experiment. Will they care about us as their creators, those that help them maintain and get to where they're going? Will they pay it forward and help humanity? These are, you would hope so. 
Yeah, would it, would it be able to do like perspective taking with a artificial intelligent, artificially intelligent system be able to take the perspective of somebody else to, to understand their goals? Uh, Russell, go for it. Uh, Russell, I believe you might be frozen. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Laptop was just going a bit slow, uh, off mute now. Yeah, um, so I think uh, uh, I think Eric and I had, had both put a couple of comments in there in response to Ben's um, initial statements that, that you've then discussed uh, since. Um, so I said, I, I think there are different levels of intelligence. Um, and I would I'd maybe classify some of the stuff Ben was talking about as instinctual intelligence, so the stuff that you're born with, you know, move away from the cold, uh, move away from loud noises, don't eat things that smell bad, you know, that type of stuff. You don't really need to learn that. You know, most um, most organic beings, um, be it, you know, animal, human, or uh, on this planet, know those things. They're born with those things. Then there's uh, like an autonomic intelligence, which is kind of, you know, it's your brain making your heartbeat, your your lungs breathe, or, or your, your, your chest muscles move to, to, to make your lungs breathe, essentially. Um, so you don't need to think about this. Your, your, your body, your, your brain is built with that inbuilt intelligence so that you don't die, essentially. And then there is kind of conscious intelligence, which is the stuff that you need to learn. You need an experience to build upon this. The other two are there um, in your DNA as you're born. The conscious level of intelligence it needs to be experiential, needs to be learned. And that's going to be the stuff that's the most difficult for AGI. So for, say, a, uh, an analog for instinctual, we can probably program in that into the, into the model. Um, and autonomic, again, can be programmed into the model. Uh, but the, the experiential, I think, is going to be more challenging. And then uh, just touching on to what uh, Tom said most recently with the empathy, I'd love to, to see that working in AI, but I'm not, I'm not that hopeful. I mean, we might be able to, as Ben was saying, um, you know, paint something prettily to replicate an analog of empathy, but I don't think it will be true empathy. I don't think we'll be able to get a model that will empathize either with another model or with a human being. Um, I'd love to see it, but I'm not, I'm just not seeing that we're, we're even close to that yet. You could do a parlor trick, which mm -hmm. is, which is cheating because you've intentionally demonstrated some type of emotional capability, your empathy that, is done to convince an audience it's not but you guys would see right through it that you're um I, this is a terrible thought but i love terrible thoughts so to throw out to the group you can imagine that this would be possible maybe in the next couple of years to do a keynote talk so imagine me on stage i'm giving a talk and i'm saying i have taught ai to learn to speak english just through experience and it's been able to learn 15 words like that feels possible right like just 15 words. I'm not talking about hundred thousand words, 15 words. And I'm on stage and I'm showing, I'm demonstrating this and it just mimics it back. Dada says Dada. I say, mama says mama. And I have, and I explained to the audience how I taught the system, how I interacted with it in my kitchen over six months. And when it would make the right sound, I would smile and I would say a lot of things to it. And when it would get close, I'd smile at it. And then I tell the audience, and this is what I do when it doesn't do what I want. And I have a lever and I pull the lever and you hear this AI system squeal in pain. And I've announced to the audience that it knows these 10 words or 15 words. And the audience knows what they are. And what they see on the screen is one of those words is not please. And now you can imagine me in front of an audience. I'm pushing this lever and they hear the AI squealing. And then they hear it starting to say, please. Because it's trying to say, please stop. And you can imagine an audience would be in a complete panic that this is this thing, that there is something there. And you guys would know that I had just engineered a very selfish or not a very, like kind of an evil trick. Like I've kind of the empathy and, and I like how you bring up empathy, Russell, because what's happening, the empathy of the audience is rushing to save this thing in a box, which they don't know what it is, but they think it's trying to say, please, which I, I don't know why does it, is anyone else's brain that weird that they're, they're thinking of like, terrible tricks to panic an audience on AGI. I think it's, I'm amused by the idea, but I know it's a terrible thing to do. It's like the, uh, the ghost in the machine type of thing. I uh, put a link here. I think it's Yosha Bach gave this talk 
Um, definitely that conversation he had on the Lex Friedman podcast, super interesting. Uh, Yosha Box, Lex, Lex Friedman, uh, first and second ones are really, really good. Um, so, so you're essentially, you, you're teaching your system by punishing it for not doing the right thing, which is essentially how machine learning works right now, like at the base level. Like we don't really teach machines to do the right thing. We teach them what not to do by penalizing them. You just don't hear the pains of the loss function yeah, delta, yeah, yeah, but maybe yeah. that'd be a good thing to add to your deep learning and models when you train them, that the AI is in this pure agony. And then yeah. as it kind of fixes that loss function, it's like breeze a sigh of relief, like, ah, like that, that, I mean, that'd be a good way to train a model, right? Can't the agony be already reflected in like the, uh, the heat being produced by your GPU as it's trying to calculate the, the right weights and biases? I, <laughs> maybe I, my brain is running wild with like all of these terrible things I could do in my basement where my kids are like, dad, what's happening downstairs? Don't go down there. It'll take a few hours for the AI to settle down. It's like a like a Omalos. Ever ever read that dystopian story about the uh -uh. the one child who's it was like Salem. Oh my God, there. yes, that yeah. was in my econ class in high school. Yeah. That was terrible. Is the 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 one child basically you get utopia, but somewhere deep down in a basement, there's one child suffering, so everyone else can <laughs> can have a utopia. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, Ben, you went down that line when you said you had a parlor trick. I thought you were going to talk about like, you know, engineering the AI to have like some sort of proclivity towards collaboration and therefore like empathy and engagement would be kind of helpful for its general directives. <laughs> but you went dark. man. Uh, that's what a startup will do to you. Sorry. It, it ruined for life. Well, it's it's funny because I. Honestly, I feel like after a couple of years now of just watching people do terrible things with like random forests, I I really kind of wonder if we could even, I mean, seriously awful things. I'm like, you're doing this with like just some very simple, like essentially numpy like arrays and manipulating them to like ruin people's lives. Um, I, I kind of don't feel like we'll ever actually, well, okay. So I guess, so... If we created an, an AGI, right, that was super altruistic and, you know, all these good things and yada, 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 like, would it really actually be human at that point? Um, and maybe this is a cynic in me where I'm like, I don't know if we can create something that, like, in order to create something that is human, I think we would have to include some pretty, like, awful things in there. Um, and I don't know if we really want to do that or if it's meant to represent the best of what we really kind of could be. Um, you know, even things, for example, like, uh, and this is why like, I shouldn't have even like gone on to LinkedIn, um, you know, like with essentially what's going on, like in Afghanistan right now, people have very strong opinions on, you know, many multiple angles of that situation. And I think one of the like most heart rending comments I read was basically like, why do people even like, cause Airbnb had announced that they were going to support temporary shelter. Uh, for some of the refugees and a lot of people had, I had seen in this one comment thread were basically like, well, why should we like, why should we help them? They deserve it. Like X, Y, Z. I'm like, okay, well, first off, y'all should just admit that you're Islamophobes. Just, just admit it. Just get it out there. Don't couch it in all this like pretty little language that ultimately ends up being the same thing. Um, but you know, like what, where would an AGI like fall on, fall on that? You know, like, I don't know. I, so to me, I'm kind of, like, do we really, in some ways, do we want AGI to really represent us like in our current state? Because it, sometimes it's, it's really beautiful, but sometimes it's really ugly. And I don't know, there's like a lot of ugliness in the world, right? Especially right now. There is, a, and this year and the last two years, there is so much ugliness. So I don't know if we really want it to represent who we are right now, but maybe we, we want it to represent something aspirational. And if we want to represent something aspirational, that might mean we have to, you know, do things, for example, like, I don't know, come up with custom data sets, right? <laughs> like seed it with something that is not human behavior, essentially. But if a human trains them, then they're still going to be human. Someone's bias is going to be inflicted in it. I mean, uh, yeah, we, we already have the bias today. And so we already have yeah. uh, the bad behavior of humans being default transferred in current AI systems and people have to weed it out. But, uh, that, you know, important things to think about is how do we save ourselves from our bad behavior? 
which is um i love this topic and i'll and i'll shut up in 10 seconds but it's like man i wish humans weren't so emotional and terrible and have these terrible biases but then it's some things about our emotions that lead to these beautiful innovations or this competitive nature like you're if you try to throw it all away where we're rational robots, humanity, like it, it's this terrible conflict. Like if you made humans more, less emotional, more rational, you start to lose the part of humanity that, you know, a lot of us celebrate. So I have something of, I guess this is just what you're saying on that humans, we're driven by emotion and stuff. Um, what would an AGI be driven by? Like, and what I'm thinking, it's not going to have an ego. Why would an AGI strive to complete something other than you? I mean, if you program a reward, but is there going to have any, like, in, can it have interesting, interesting, like, motivation to do something? Or is it just going to be lazy and just, like, sit on a beach and then watch the sunset or do nothing? Like, um, go, uh, go for it. Yeah, this is great. Um, so to several points on this, if we were going to create an AI that was like an archetype human, would we really have the ability to figure out what an archetype was and would we agree on what the archetype was? Meaning a, a super moral, super high character AI. But I'd like to ask y'all to aim your thinking at just a slightly different way. And, and more to Ben's purpose. Well, if we're gonna start with AGI, why don't we start at baby AGI? But I'd like to, and I think that was an excellent point, but come a step before that and think, okay, let's say I could point out an architecture that had the best hope of getting to baby AGI. And I, I have a guess it would be a hybrid of a bunch of transformers and other deep learning mechanisms a lot of sensors coming into this AGI. Let's assume it's like an Android. And yeah, now it has the capability because it's got all these hybrid processing things that can interconnect, but so what? Now you have to figure out, oh, RLs require a value system and they require specific training methods. And it's, if we're gonna use the technology that we're roughly using now and just at a more advanced stage, oh, how, how do I convert all these questions to a mathematical statement that can result in training? To me, like, I think empathy is, could, we could discuss for another 30 minutes and agree empathy between, fellow AIs and, and humans for an AI to survive is essential. Um, you know, being part of a community. If, how do you turn that into rewards and loss statements in a training system so they get that? But then if it was just math, are they really ever going to become sentient? These are the kind of questions that I run up against a wall with when I think about AGI. And then it's like Ben said, at the end of the day, wasn't it just a mathematical parlor trick? So that was a lot all at once, sorry. But those are the kind of things that run through my head with this. And why I keep saying, have we really asked the right questions clearly enough to where we can turn them into math statements? Because at the end of the day, the AI is a giant set of math machines. I think it's interesting that you said that, Tom. Uh, you know, talking about it being math, because um, essentially our, our organic neurological systems probably break things down to, you know, to to mathematical functions. You know, it is or it isn't something. You know, we respond. If it is, um, we respond a different way. If it isn't, although it's far more complex than anything we can currently build in the electronic space at the moment. Uh, and then and then just jumping back to, you know, if we were to build a, a baby AGI and, and let's put the empathy to, to the side for the minute. If I was to, to try and build a baby AGI at the moment, I think that the, the key things you need is um, some uh, image recognition model. So it would recognize a few key people or it could learn to recognize a few key people. Um, some audio monitoring so it could listen to um, some of the uh, the vocal 
um, feedback it was getting and um, some audio creation so it could make vocalizations. Then if it was recognizing a few key people and it was just experimenting with random vocalizations as a baby would do, but every time it hit on something that was kind of close to a word, uh, a person would give it some feedback that it could then interpret. That'd be a really interesting thing just to leave that learning on its own, you know, completely unsupervised, just to see if organically it could start to come up with some analog for, um, for language. That, that'd be a really interesting um, experiment, I think. Self-supervised learning, I think, would be a, the, the, the right type of uh, term there. That might be the key to, uh, to AGI, self-supervised learning. Look, guys, it's been a great discussion. I definitely, definitely enjoyed this. A lot of great comments, a lot of great chats. Um, uh, I highly recommend you guys check out this, uh, this futureoflife.org uh, forward slash AI dash aftermath dash scenario. Uh, lays out 12 different scenarios ranging from libertarian utopia to self-destruction. This is kind of an accompanying website to Max Tegmark's books, Life 3.0, which is also a good book to, uh, to tune in. If you enjoy this conversation, definitely check that book out. Um, trying to get Max on the podcast. Uh, so hopefully that happens. Uh, um, yeah. So guys, thanks again for, for joining in. Next week, we have a special guest host who's going to be taking over uh, the airwaves of the Artists of Data Science podcast. Uh, Antonio will be hosting next week while I, um, while I head out to, uh, to BC with the wife uh, for, for a wedding. So I got to get myself a Hawaiian t-shirt or something for it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's actually it's it's cold and raining outside today so like all right i'm going back into a fall flannel mode and sweaters um but guys thanks for joining in don't forget to check out the episode uh that i released with jeff lee earlier today he got a freestyle rap right at the beginning i thought it was super cool i uh, also was on the ken g podcast ken's nearest neighbors podcast so check that out as well um don't forget i'm, I'm launching a course soon as well just got to uh, do some recordings for it and it's all about uh, how to essentially become an employable data scientist we're going to talk about how to manage yourself how to think like a scientist how to think like an engineer how to think like a business person so i'm excited to uh, to start recording that stuff and getting that course out there uh thanks again for tuning in everybody remember my friends you've got one life on this planet why not try to do something big cheers everybody. i saved this chat just so y'all know Yes, I've got the chat saved as well. I'll be sure to, okay. uh, to, to copy and paste it, uh, a link to it. I'll put it as a blog post on the uh, Fireside website. All right, guys. Bye.